So I wanna go through some important things today. Today's not necessarily the demonstration on how to do an oil change, it's more or less why and when, all right? So regular oil changes. Make sure you're doing regular oil changes. Everybody will argue with you about what is the proper intervals. You'll hear different things. You could go on YouTube and watch 10 different videos and probably get 10 different opinions. You can ask a Honda tech and they'll tell you one thing. You could ask a GM tech and they'll tell you another thing. The biggest thing I can tell you is change it regularly. This is a fluid that you really can't change it too much. So if it says to change your oil, if, if General Motors says to change the oil in a 2020 Tahoe every 7,500 miles, if you change it every 5,000, it's not going to hurt it. If you change it every 10,000, that's not good. So you want to at least stay with the OEM manufacturers. And when I say OEM, that's original equipment manufacturer. So that's GM, Ford, Honda, whoever. You want to at least stay with their recommended oil changes or sooner. For me, I'm still kind of old school. I still change things sooner, and I'll get into that a little bit in a little while here, all right? So make sure it's changed regularly. Becomes contaminated over time if you do not. Remember, there's a lot of friction. There's a lot of heat. There's a lot of other chemicals. There's a lot going on inside that engine, a lot of moving parts and a lot of heat building up. So these things heat up, then you shut them off at Walmart, and they cool down. Then they heat back up, and you drive it home, and then they sit in your driveway and cool down. Then they heat back up. That cycle plays a toll on the oil. In the lubrication system. Time plays a toll. If the vehicle, you change the oil and it only has 1,500 miles on it since you changed the oil, but it sat in your driveway for a year, it still needs an oil change because time, over time, those additives break down. Um, they become contaminated. The oil becomes contaminated over time. There's always a little bit of gasoline and, and vapors that get into the crankcase that now mix with the oil. There is moisture that gets into it. We try to obviously keep water out of the engine, but there's moisture in the air. On a really humid day, you're pulling air into this engine, you're squeezing it really tight in a combustion chamber. On a really humid day, you're squeezing the moisture out of that. So there is moisture that gets into it and just in the air in general. Um, so moisture gets into the oil over time. So you have to change it. When moisture gets in there, then it starts to sludge up with the other contaminants in there. And here's a picture I have up here, you can see of an engine that has gone excessively between oil changes and you can see all the sludge and crud. Um, I have pictures and I'll pull up a couple pictures if I can find them on here. They may be on my actual desktop at school. So I apologize if I can't find them of real life situations that I had in the shop engines that I have specifically torn down engines. So it's not just me sitting here reading out of a textbook telling you change your oil regularly and recommend it to customers regularly. It's, I've seen it in the real world. I've seen what it can do when people go 10, 12, 15,000 miles on an oil change. All right. Additives wear out over time. There's different additives in oil. And some of the main ones are friction modifiers to help with friction and lubrication, dispersants to take any dirt that comes loose in that engine and disperse it. That means to take it with it to the oil filter and trap it in the filter. Detergents. You know, you've heard the term detergents before, laundry detergent, things like that. It's a cleaner. So there's detergents in it to help clean the inside of the engine as it's working and other additives that are added too. Those all break down over a period of time. Oil today is better than it's ever been. Back in the day, if you went over 3,000 miles on an oil change, you were, you know, you were causing damage to your engine. Nowadays, I've seen cars, you know, some manufacturers recommend to change the oil 10,000 miles. Um, there is now annual oil out there that is good for 25,000 miles or one year. I don't want to test it out, but they say it's out there and you're going to start seeing manufacturers go longer and longer in between oil changes because that brings the cost of ownership of their vehicle down. So when you're buying a vehicle and you look at the fuel mileage, you look at the options on the window sticker, you look at the cost of maintenance and ownership. They want to be lower than the next guy because if everything else is the same on that car and you're looking at a Ford and you're looking at a Honda, but the Honda looks cheaper to maintain every year, most people are going to go with the cheaper to maintain vehicle. So they're spreading these oil changes out. Plus the oil has gotten better over the years. When do you want to change it? You want to follow OEM maintenance schedules if all else fails. All right. So my textbook answer is follow the manufacturer's maintenance schedules. I'm going to tell you my answer, my personal answer here in a second. Use the service information, service manuals to locate when they should have their oil changed. 
also located in the vehicle's owner's manual. So if you pull out your owner's manual, your parent's owner's manual in the glove box next time you're in a car and you flip through and find a maintenance schedule, it'll give you information on changing oil and when you should do it and what type of oil you should use. A good rule of thumb, this is Wartman's rule of thumb, all right? Conventional oil, if you stick with changing it every 3,000 miles or three months, you will be good. Synthetic oil, if you stick with changing it every 5,000 miles or six months, believe me, you will be good. I have used this method since I've started driving cars and knock on wood, I've had good luck. All right, this is an old school method. If you talk to a lot of old school mechanics, they'll tell you, you'll say, hey, well, Honda says it changes every 10,000 miles. Uh, most mechanics and technicians are going to say, yeah, but we recommend 5,000 for a synthetic, 3,000 for a conventional. All right, so that's just a good rule of thumb. Oil life monitors. Every vehicle you're going to work on now has some sort of a maintenance or oil life monitoring system. They started using these in the 90s, um, very primitive versions of them. Early 2000s, cars like Mercedes, Cadillacs, BMWs had them, higher end cars. Now everything has them. Um, it's a computer system that's monitoring the time, mileage, conditions, and your driving habits. So if you have two exact same Kia Sorentos sitting side by side, and you're driving one and I'm driving one, and we drive differently, we drive in different conditions, and our trips are different, our oil life monitoring system is going to adjust to us. So if I'm somebody that does short trips, for example, I work 10 miles from home. I fire my car up, I drive to work, I shut it off. I fire it up, I drive home, I shut it off. That's pretty hard. That's actually kind of hard on an engine um, because it doesn't have time to heat up properly and burn the moisture off inside the engine. So short trips are very hard on a vehicle. Maybe you're somebody that gets in your car, starts it up, lets it warm up in the morning, and then drives 30 miles, 40 miles to work on the highway, and then 30, 40 miles home. You do a lot of long trips. That's actually sometimes a little easier on the vehicle because it's staying at a constant pace. It's the engines are designed to warm up and run. So that's, you know, different scenarios that you could have right there. So our oil life monitoring will be different. Mine's going to change differently than yours would by your driving habits. Um, so it monitors all that to the computer system. Here's a picture here of a, this looks like a GM oil life monitoring system I put on here. You can pull it up. It's going to tell you how much percentage is remaining. <clears throat> Good rule of thumb, guys, and a strict note here that I want to give out to you guys. Do not wait until the oil life says zero. Many people think, oh, still says 3%. I'm good to go for a little while. That's not how oil life monitor systems work. If you look at most owner's manuals and most manufacturer's recommendations on how to use the oil life monitoring system in your specific vehicle, you will find that it says things similar to change oil at 30% or when oil percent gets to 20%, start scheduling an oil change. They don't actually want you to wait till zero, all right? By then it's kind of too late. So make sure you're monitoring that, keep an eye on that, and make sure we'll get into resetting those when we do our oil change demonstration, all right? I personally, me personally, I do not go by the oil life monitors. I watch them. I monitor them and see where they're at. Um, but I still change my oil every 3,000 miles or three months approximately. Pretty much all the oil you get now is synthetic. You used to have conventional, full synthetic, and then they had synthetic blends. Pretty much now everything's either conventional or synthetic. Most every car on the road today uses a synthetic from 2010 and up. So I'll go a little longer. So for example, on an older vehicle I drive, my Grand Prix I drive every day, I use a synthetic blend um, or a conventional oil in it most of the time. I, every 3,000 miles or three months, I change that oil. My wife's 2020 Tahoe uses a full synthetic. Um, they recommend 7,500 miles of the manufacturer. I change it every 5,000 miles or six months. Remember, you can wait too long. You cannot change it enough, but you really can't change it too much. Um, People ask me all the time, is it going to hurt if I change my oil, my synthetic oil every 3,000 miles? No, it's not going to hurt. It's going to cost you a little more money, but it's not going to hurt. I always looked at it as I would rather spend 30 bucks every 3,000 miles to change my own oil instead of trying to go a whole year without changing my oil and end up spending $3,000 on an engine. That's just me. I've done this and my personal experience is I've never had a catastrophic engine failure due to lubrication. I have never 
had an engine blow up on one of my vehicles and any of my family's vehicles, we have never had a catastrophic engine failure due to lubrication. There may have been other issues, but never due to lubrication. I have taken engines apart of mine that had over 100,000 miles on them to do a repair or like an intake gasket job or something and looked inside the lifter valleys and they looked like they had 10,000 miles on the engines. That's because I've used good oil, quality oil, quality filters, and I've changed my oil regularly at these intervals. So my textbook answer for you guys is follow the OEM recommended procedures for their maintenance schedules. My personal recommendation, 3,000 miles or three months for conventional, 5,000, six months for synthetic, and you will be fine. Here's an example of a ProDemand maintenance schedule. We use for our service information, we use ProDemand, other shops use different things. When I worked at a GM garage, we use GM service information. All that information's in there somewhere depending on what type of service manual you're using. So I had a little screenshot, I built a vehicle here. This is a 2020 Tahoe. They're saying here, there's nothing before 7,500 miles. They're saying 7,500 miles should be the first service, inspect, engine oil and filter, inspect the oil life monitor, rotate the tires, and so forth and so forth. So if you look here, it's telling you inspect this. Look how long it's telling us that we could go on this oil. I don't do that. 5,000 miles came up. I changed the oil in that truck at 4,700 miles because I knew 5,000 miles was coming up. I want to play it safe. We spent a lot of money for these vehicles. I want to keep them for a long time. Here's another example of the time. If you scroll down on that pro demand screen, when you're looking in there, it has not only a mileage interval, it has a time interval. So it's saying every 12 months, replace the engine oil and filter every 24 months, so forth and so forth. So not only look at the mileage, look at the time, because some of you may drive short trips and you may not put 7,500 miles on it in 12 months. You might only put 3,000 miles on it in a year, but that doesn't mean your oil doesn't need changed. You have to know this for customers when you're working in a shop as a technician. Look at the customer's schedules. When you look at their service history and you look they were in last year and they have only put 3,000 miles on their car in a year, but they haven't had an oil change in a year. Recommend an oil change, all right? A lot of people don't think about this stuff. You as a professional technician need to inform the customers. You guys are not only a technician, you're sort of a teacher. You have to teach and inform your customers of these things. What specs do we need to worry about with oils? Well, first and foremost, once again, my textbook answer is gonna be research OEM oil recommendations. I always use what the manufacturer recommends. Remember, guys, they have engineers that they pay a lot of money to figure this stuff out. They do years and years and years of testing to figure out which oil viscosity, which oil ratings work best in their engines with their components under different conditions. I don't second guess those guys. Those guys are really smart. They have a lot of education, a lot of knowledge, and they get paid a lot of money to do what they do. So I follow their recommendations. I follow their viscosity, API ratings, and if they want synthetic or conventional. So with that said, you can see a picture here. It says full synthetic. Always look at the oil that you're getting. Look at the ratings right on it. On the front of this oil jug right here, you can see, let me turn on my little spotlight here. get this out of the way you can see here it says it's full synthetic the viscosity rating 5w30 and it has an api seal so you know it passes the api ratings on the back it'll tell you exactly what rating it is it tells you what the viscosity is it tells you if it's synthetic or conventional here's what i want to tell you guys if a vehicle is required by the manufacturer or recommended to use synthetic oil Use synthetic oil, do not put conventional in it. If your vehicle is a conventional oil vehicle, then it would be acceptable, it would be acceptable to use synthetic in a conventional oil. Does that make sense? So what I mean by that is I have a car that I run conventional in, it's okay to upgrade to synthetic, but do not downgrade to conventional in a vehicle, all right? There's myths and rumors that in the past, you can't mix them. If your car ran conventional, you can't upgrade it to synthetic because there's still some conventional oil left in there and it can't mix, it'll cause problems. I've been told over the years and I have found that's a myth. 
I wouldn't recommend putting half four quarts of synthetic and four quarts of conventional in it because it just does not make sense. But changing from conventional and upgrading the synthetic is not going to hurt your vehicle. It's only going to have benefits for you. Okay. Most all vehicles today are synthetic. That's just what you're going to see because of the benefits. They allow for longer oil change intervals. So the OEMs like that because they can make their cars less expensive to own throughout the year. Um, and it also has improved wear additives and things like that. The synthetic oil also resists against thermal breakdown. So these cars nowadays run at hotter temperatures than they ever did. My 72 GTO, if I see 220 on the gauge, I'm in trouble. On my 2020 Tahoe, normal operating temperature is 220 degrees. So over the years, they've made these cars run hotter and hotter to help lower emissions and things like that. So with that, now we need to run synthetic oils that can resist wear to that heat, all right? They resist thermal breakdown, so that's another advantage of it. All right. Multi-viscosity oils, all right? I'm not even gonna discuss you know, single viscosity oils like back in the day because we don't use those anymore. I've never used those since I've been working on cars. You may see them if you're working in an antique car shop where some guys may want to use what came from the factory and still use those methods. But there's no reason why you can't upgrade an older vehicle to multi-viscosity oils. Everything you're gonna see on the shelf today is a multi-viscosity oil or multi-grade oil. So you'll see things like 5W30. Back in the day, you used to see a, a, a 30 weight oil and it was that was the viscosity. It was a 30 weight oil. Now, you'll see 5W30. So with that, that is telling you you can run this in the winter and you can run this in the summer. Technically back in the day when you had, when you didn't have multi-viscosity oils, multi-grade oils, you had to change your oil. What you ran in the winter, you wanted to change out and run something different in the summer. Remember in the summer, things get hotter, the temperature's hotter, the cars run hotter. When you start that car up, it may already be 80 or 90 degrees outside. So the oil is naturally going to be thinner and flow easier. Think about any types of fluids or anything when it's super cold, things pour slower, they're thicker. So in the summer, if you had too thin of an oil in it, you could cause damage to your engine because it was already thin and now it's warm, so it's thinned out even more, it's not lubricating like it should. In the winter time, you wanted a thinner oil because a thicker oil would flow slower. So when you start that engine up, if it takes longer to flow that oil through the engine, it's causing damage every time you start the vehicle. So they came up with multi-viscosity, multi-grade oils. So you'll see this 5W30. The common misconception is W in a 5W or 10W or 20W30 application stands for weight. It does not stand for weight. And I want you guys to remember this. If you remember nothing else today, remember this. And the reason being is you're probably thinking, Workman, that's pretty crazy. Why is that that important? Well, I'll tell you why it's important. Most people don't know it. Most technicians and shops don't know that. And there are test questions that you will see that involve this. For example, I had students go out, a group of students go out to Ohio Technical College one year for a scholarship entrance exam to see if they could get scholarships to go to their school. They went out to Ohio. They drove out there as a group. They went through the tour. They took the scholarship entrance exam and one of the questions that they got wrong, most of them, not all of them, a few of them listened and remembered, but most of them got wrong was they came back and they said, what does W stand for in 10W30? Does it stand for winter? I said, yeah. And they said, see, I told you. They didn't, they didn't know that. So that was a question on an entrance exam for a post-secondary school. So make sure you guys remember that. That's telling you that 5W for the winter time, this is going to flow easier in the winter time. And 30, in the summertime, it's going to thicken up and flow better in the summertime. So oil has better flowing capabilities in the winter, all right? It's thinner in colder temps. The 30 is better flowing in the summer, it's thicker in hotter temps. There's more science to it than that, but that's just the basic overview of what you need to remember. This is the way I think about it in my head, thinner and thicker, all right? Some OEMs are using oil as thin as 0W20 nowadays. So the advantage, that's pretty thin, um, that's pretty thin oil. When you pour it out of an of a oil jug, it almost <laughs> looks like water. I was very skeptical of it for years, but the additives that they're putting in the oil 
are amazing and they work. The reason they're doing this is the oil can flow quicker on cold startups. Another reason is it is improving fuel mileage. It improves fuel mileage because there's less resistance. So think about if you're trying to push a car while somebody has the brake pedal slightly engaged, you're going to wear out quicker trying to push that car because there's way more resistance. Now, you put that car in neutral and there are no brakes on, now the car is easier to push. That's exactly the concept of using the thinner oil the manufacturers are using nowadays. So now that the additives and friction modifiers are better, this is allowing them to thin the oils out and still get the same lubrication capabilities, but also see improved fuel mileage and lower emissions. If the car is working, if the car is not working as hard, it's not going to put out more emissions. Just like you pushing that car with the brakes on, you're going to be breathing heavier and breathe in and out more. Well, same with a car. If it's working harder, it's going to breathe out more emissions. If it's working easier, there's less resistance, it's not working as hard, it's not gonna put out as much emissions. So those are some advantages of why cars, you look at Hondas and a lot of foreign cars, they're going to a zero W oil. It's, it's pretty, pretty insane. API ratings, this is a rating you need to know. I don't care if you memorize any of this, you don't need to memorize this. There are charts for this, there are websites for this, and there's information in your service manual and your owner's manual for this. But when you look at an oil jug, you'll see this donut over here. This is what we call the API donut. Look for that. If the oil you are buying is cheap and it does not have this on it, don't use it. Most oil you find on Walmart shelf, all the oil you're gonna find at Advanced Auto Parts or AutoZone should have this on it. They shouldn't be selling an oil that's not approved by the American Petroleum Institute. On the back of that jug, you will see this donut right here, and it will tell you API service SN rating. SN is one of the newer ratings. They change year by year by year over a certain amount of time. As you can see on that chart below, I have kind of a, a timeline up to 2011. We need, I need to get a newer timeline up because we are up to 2020 now. Um, but that's kind of a timeline to show you how the ratings change over time. So make sure you're using the correct rating for your vehicle. Um, if you look down here, if we were running a 1972 Pontiac GTO, I could, you know, it called for an SE rating. Could I put an SN in it? Absolutely. Once again, you can go backwards with this, but you can't go the opposite way. So for example, I can't run an SE in a 2011, but I could run the SN in a 1972. Taking the newer oil standards and putting them in an older car is not necessarily going to hurt you but putting the older standards in a newer car will cause problems and void warranties. I have seen manufacturers take oil samples and take them to a lab and check them to see if they were using the right oil and void warranties on engines because of that. Um, a lot of the foreign car manufacturers are good for doing that. They'll request an oil sample and check it. So you wanna make sure you're using the right stuff. With that said, in older vehicles, some of you guys may be running some older vehicles, have a project car, there are some things that have been taken out of modern oils that older cars needed. Mr. Highlands and I talk about this periodically. There was zinc, um, it's, it's called zinc ZDDP, that was in there um, back in the day. There used to be other additives in there that used to help flat tap at camshafts, things like that. So on my older cars, I run a newer SN oil, but I run a high performance or a classic car oil in it. Uh, most high performance racing oils, like I use a Valvoline VR1 oil in it. It's a high performance oil, but it has the added zinc in it. The reason that companies have taken the zinc out of the oil is for emissions purposes. If your car starts burning some oil, they don't want you to be burning the zinc and the lead that used to be in the oil and burning it into the atmosphere. Okay, so that's why they took lead out of gasoline back in the early 70s, I believe it was, late 60s, early 70s. So they've taken that out for emissions reasons, but you can still buy high performance oil to an SN standard that has these additives in it. So keep that in mind, all right? You will see SN plus. This is a new rating that's come up. You will see, you know, these ratings with a plus sign. So you'll start to see these with, for turbocharged vehicles, 
Turbocharged vehicles used to be very scarce from the factory. Now everything's coming turbocharged. You get a Chevy Cruze turbocharged, you get Honda's turbo, everything's coming turbocharged for better performance. They can run smaller engines, better fuel mileage, but still get more performance out of it. So look at Ford. They've been using EcoBoost turbocharged engines for a while now. They can run a V6 engine and still make three, 400 horsepower. With that said, they have found that there was a need for a, you know, additional oil standards for those because now you're added more heat into the turbochargers. They're breaking the oil down quicker. The turbocharger bearings were failing. So now you'll see a plus sign on a lot of these things for turbocharged applications. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. So make sure you're doing your research for what vehicle you're servicing that you're using the correct API rating. Oil filter types. The two main type of oil filter types you're going to come in contact with changing oil is a cartridge style oil here on the bottom and a canister style filter here. This is probably the most common oil filter you guys have seen. This oil filter is still used on all kinds of vehicles, but all kinds of vehicles are also using this. This is an example right here. Just by looking at this block, I could tell you from working on GMs, this looks like a GM Ecotech 2.2 liter or 2.4 liter that came in a Chevy Cobalt or a Cavalier for a while, Chevy Cobalt, Pontiac G5s, G6 four-cylinder cars, things like that. We have one sitting in our shop in the corner that you guys can look at. It uses a cartridge style filter. You have to take the cap off and you usually change these from under the hood. And I'll get into that more in oil change lessons. You pull this out and you change this. They've gone to this method because they work well. It makes it easier to access the oil filter in a lot of places. Um, cheaper to manufacture, but still get the same results. It has an O-ring here that you have to change in service. We'll talk more about that in our service lessons. The canister style filter right here is this element contained inside of a canister. If you cut one of these apart, it looks just like this. Oil comes in, gets filtered, comes back out. Most all oil filters have what they call a drain back, an anti-drain back valve. That anti-drain back valve is when you shut the engine oil off, it keeps oil in the system instead of oil draining back into the filter or sorry, draining out of the filter. And then the next time you start the vehicle, you have a few seconds of a dry start. So there are anti-drain back valves. Filter companies do different things. There are basic standards for oil filters, and then companies also advertise, when you look at them, you'll see they advertise better filtration systems, better drain back valves, all kinds of different things. So my suggestion for you guys is use a quality filter. And just because it doesn't say Fram or it doesn't say K&N on it doesn't mean it's a quality filter. Do your research. For example, I've been talking to the guys at Advanced Auto Parts and I've done a little bit of my own research. The CarQuest filters, I used to stay away from because they were a plain looking white filter that just said CarQuest on it, didn't have much information. They didn't look fancy, so I assumed they were not a fancy oil filter. But I was wrong. I've done some research, gone off of what they said and went a little bit further researching on my, my own. CarQuest has Wix build their filters. Wix is a very good oil filter brand. Wix is used on a lot of race cars and a lot of performance applications and things like that. Wix builds a lot of good components and oil filters. They are who build CarQuest oil filters. Now they have their own different levels of oil filters. They have the red label filters, they call them. And then they have the blue level. The blue level filters, I've been informed, were a higher quality filter that they use more for high performance, longer, uh, longer intervals, things like that. So I have started using them after doing research. Saved a couple bucks and I'm using a quality filter. Other than that, I have always used a manufacturer filter. I, run G I have a lot of GM vehicles, so I always run a GM AC Delco filter. I look at it this way. If the manufacturer recommends this filter, this is what I want to use because if I have any kind of issue with my engine while it's under warranty, I want to be able to look General Motors in the eye and say, listen, I used what you told me to use and your engine failed. I need compensated. Now, if I they check it and I have a Fram oil filter or some other off-brand oil filter on it, they could try to battle it. GM's not too bad about that, but I will tell you working in the GM shop and Kia being attached to us, the Kia shop, the technicians will tell you, if you were running a non-Kia filter and you didn't have your oil change receipts, they will void your warranty. They have a 10,000 mile, 10,000 
sorry, 10 year, 100,000 mile powertrain warranty on their engines. They have one of the best powertrain warranties in the industry. But with that, they also want to make sure that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing to maintain your vehicle. So I saw cars come into that shop with a blown up engine or a spun rod bearing or something, and they inspect it. The warranty adjuster comes out, looks at it, and they say, guess what? Kia wants you to run a Kia filter. They want oil change receipts. This customer has a Pep Boys oil filter on it. They didn't change the oil filter gasket like they're supposed to in the Kia service manual, and they can't prove that they had their oil changed regularly. We're voiding the warranty, and the customer had to pay for the engine. So I highly suggest to use what the manufacturer recommends. Now, once some of my vehicles are out of warranty, I still tend to use the AC Delta oil filters, but like I said, as of recently doing some research, I've started using Wix and some CarQuest filters because of that. All right, so use a quality filter is what I'm getting at. You don't necessarily have to spend $20 for an oil filter to achieve what you need to do, all right? A four or five dollar quality oil filter will do the job just fine, especially if you're changing it regularly. Drain plug gaskets. With drain plug gaskets, you want to make sure you're inspecting those. Here's some different examples, and no, I do not have every single example up there. You will run across different styles. Here is a style that, like on most GMs that I deal with, it has an integrated O-ring gasket into the drain plug. Um, some people say you can change these. I have changed them before, but GM recommends if this gasket is damaged or crushed, replace the entire drain plug, which I kind of like that method. I see what they did there. They integrated this on the drain plug. So guess what? Every so often, it's forcing you to change the drain plug just to play it safe. The drain plugs cost you about two bucks. It's worth changing every now and then to make sure that you have a good drain plug and gasket in there. If you see any damage to these drain plugs, you wanna change them. So when you're doing an oil change and we do our demonstration on oil changes, you'll see I inspect the threads on here, I inspect the threads in the drain or in the oil pan. Most oil pans are aluminum now, they're very easily stripped as opposed to a steel pan that used to be a little bit more difficult to strip. You still could do it, but it took a little more abuse. So torquing your drain plugs is key nowadays because of the softer materials, the softer metals, and these gaskets. You don't wanna crush these gaskets beyond what they're designed to be crushed. Here's an example of a composite or carbon you know, felt type gasket, paper type gasket. And here's an example of crushed gaskets. They come in aluminum, and these also come in a copper. They're soft. When you tighten this down, they're designed to crush against the pan to seal up the oil pan to the drain plug surface. Now, these are usually recommended to change every oil change. I'm going to use Kia for an example again, because that's what I have experience with. They want you to change every oil change. They want you to put a new drain plug gasket on. When you are at a Kia dealership as a technician and you go to the parts counter to get your oil change parts and supplies, the oil chain or the, the parts guy will hand you an oil filter with a new crush gasket in the box. You're supposed to change those every time. GM, we reuse them until they need changed. All right. So some things to remember and take away from this today. Always remember regular intervals. You can argue with me all day long about 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, 7,500, whatever it may be. Regular intervals is key. That's what I want you to take away from it. Always, you know, all those fails always go with the manufacturer's recommendations because guess what? If you change the oil when they say to change it, you're following their procedures, your warranty will work out to your advantage if you have a problem. From a technician standpoint, you want to make sure that you're following the OEM recommended procedures for the company you work for. If I work for Hyundai, I'm going to follow Hyundai's procedure. If I work for BMW, I'm going to follow their recommendations. If I work for GM, I'm following theirs. So you want to make sure the customer's cars are taken care of in a tip-top shape. Regular intervals is key. Like I said, you can't change them too often. If you go with the good rule of thumb of 3,000 miles every three months for conventional, 5,000 and six months for synthetic, you will be okay, and you will have long engine life of your vehicle. Recommended oil specs. Don't make up your own recommendations. You're not an engineer, I'm not an engineer. Someday if you become an engineer, I will be so happy to hear that. I hope you come back and tell me that you're an engineer, and I hope you tell me that I should use this type of oil because of this, and I will listen to you. 
But right now, none of us are engineers. Go with what the engineers recommend. They spend a lot of time and money and energy figuring out what to use. So recommended oil spec, look them up. Always change the, or always change the filter. Some people will say, well, I change the oil and every other time I change the filter. It's not worth it. Change the filter every oil change. Reason I say that is a quality oil filter is gonna cost you $6 or less. If I'm already spending 25 or 30 bucks for the oil, what's another $5 to make sure that my engine lasts for an extremely long time? I have many vehicles. In fact, right now, all of my vehicles are either close to 100,000 or well over 100,000 miles. And they run like they have 20,000 miles on them. I change my oil regularly, I maintain my vehicles. So always change the filter. Spend the extra couple bucks and get a filter. Inspect the drain plug and gasket and threads when you're doing oil changes. Always inspect them. Inspect them when the car is in for anything else. When you're in my shop at the school and we have a car in for just a tire rotation or inspect shocks or an air filter replacement, if the car is in the shop and on the lift or on jack stands, take a peek at the gaskets on the oil filter, take a peek at the oil drain plug and gaskets. Don't remove it and drain the oil, but just take a peek on it over the flashlight. If you see the drain plug leaking, we need to investigate further. And last but not least, dispose of your oil properly. Do not, that does not mean take it over and dump it down the drain. That doesn't mean take it out and use it as weed killer in your backyard. You are not supposed to do that today. EPA has strict guidelines and regulations of how you are supposed to properly dispose of your waste oil. Remember, people argue with me and say, well, the oil came out of the ground, it can go back in the ground. I get that. The oil did come out of the ground. But you have to remember, the oil that came out of the ground to the oil that just came out of your engine is not the same oil anymore. The oil came out of the ground, it has been refined to run in an engine, and it has had other additives added into it. Then it has been run through an engine for an extended period of time under various conditions, and now has fuel contaminants, carbon contaminants, um, hydrocarbons, all kinds of different things that have now contaminated that oil that are not good to go back into the ground. So make sure you're disposing of them properly. In our shop, we have our waste oil shed outside. We have drums out there that say waste oil. That's where we dump our waste oil. Let's talk oil. Oil is the lifeblood of your vehicle. It keeps your engine lubricated and clean. So guess what? A lot can happen if you neglect its oil. None of it good. Run out of oil and the metal on metal friction will get so hot, your engine can literally weld itself together. <laughs> can you say hot mess? Or let's say your engine has oil, but you never change it. Two things can happen over time. One, dirt can build up in the oil, making it thick and abrasive, which can cause engine damage and eventual failure. Or two, the good stuff in your oil, like detergents, rust biters, and friction reducers will break down, which can lead to loss of lubrication, and again, can cause engine damage and eventual failure. Bottom line, your engine needs regular oil and filter changes. How often depends on a variety of factors, like the age of your vehicle, the type of oil you use, and your driving habits and conditions. So hey, check your oil often and get it changed regularly. It can help you do more than avoid big time engine damage. It can also help you enjoy some great benefits like improved fuel economy, smoother, quieter engine performance, and longer engine life. So if your vehicle is due for an oil change, bring it to the Mopar service specialist at your local Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Fiat dealer.